<laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay, we're going to continue in Ephesians uh, this morning. Now, many people would say, and the Bible would agree with this, that we live in a world where human beings, so often left to themselves, seem to go in the wrong direction, <laughs> in the wrong direction of travel. And uh, not only that, but we remain cheerfully confident that we're going in the right direction, even when we're going in the wrong direction. And uh, you only have to look at society and the world, and it's not difficult to see that. I remember I had a friend at university, and uh, she was telling me one day that uh, her and her husband had gone on holiday, and uh, she knew her husband was really tired, she'd just come off a, he'd just come off a night shift. So he, she said, I'll drive, and they got on the motorway, she drove 200 miles. And uh, she was feeling really pleased with herself. She said, oh, so and so will be, my husband will be so pleased. I've, done, I've really bitten off a huge chunk of the journey, 200 miles. And when he woke up, you can guess what happened. You have, she'd gone 200 miles south when they were due to go 200 miles north. So they now had to do another 200 miles just to get back to the starting place. <laughs> so, in the wrong direction. And uh, <laughs> well, we're going to look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and the passage today starts with people going in the wrong direction. Okay. Written from prison to this thriving church of believers who'd been really deeply impacted uh, by the gospel and had been reaching out to the surrounding areas, planting churches in, in nearby towns of what is now uh, southwest Turkey. There's a thing about the wrong way, by the way. And he, he starts off this section reminding them and telling them to remember the direction they had been travelling in and what a change had taken place in their lives because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that had been preached to them. They'd been going in one direction completely and confidently, but wrongly. And now God had intervened. So we're going to read uh, Ephesians 2 and verses 1 to 10. No. Let me read these. It's on the, book, on the uh, screen if you, if you want to follow it. I'm reading from the ESV. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, I just ask, as we come to your word, that you will speak to us, Lord, as we meditate on this, hear your word preach. God, will you speak to our hearts, and uh, Lord, set on our, our hearts on fire again, Lord, with, with zeal and fervour for you, Lord. Lord, we ask in your name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we've, uh, we've, we've looked at, in the past, we've looked at new identity, in Ephesians 1 and the new treasure that we have in Ephesians 1 and uh, uh, and today we're looking at we, if you remember Paul prayed that wonderful prayer in Ephesians 1 and uh, he prayed that we would know him more we know Jesus don't we many of us here know Jesus but the prayer is that we would know him more and our hearts and minds would be enlightened and be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and Paul ends that section by saying that God placed all things under his feet, that's Jesus, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, 
which is his body. That's the end of Ephesians 1. So that's how he ends. In other words, he's saying, we believers, like you and I, like the church, the body of Christ, we're filled with the spirit of Christ, under the lordship of Christ, and he is head over everything, in particular, and especially, the church. And then he starts our passage with, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Which is a real sort of gear change, isn't it? It's like, another gear. As for you lot, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So we, we of course have to ask the question, well, why is he saying this? Why is he writing like that? Well, I think there are two main reasons. Firstly, because we so easily fail to realise how dead we were and how we were going in the wrong direction and how sometimes we do go in the wrong direction. We, t- we fail to realise the seriousness and consequences of our life and what it means to be without Christ. It's a really serious thing, Paul is saying. And secondly, we fail to grasp how glorious and amazing our salvation is. That's why he's writing like this. It's, you could ask the question, why is our experience of salvation at times, and for some, such a sort of matter-of-fact thing? Why are we sometimes so lacking in fervour and zeal? Why is prayer so low on our agenda? Why is concern for the lost so casual? Why is worship and singing to God so half-hearted at times? It's partly because we haven't realised the depths of sin and hopelessness and evil that we've been saved from and the glorious heights of eternal salvation that we've been saved to. We've been saved from and we've been saved to. From something that was absolutely desperate to something that is absolutely glorious. And that's what we're going to look at in this passage and what Paul writes about. And firstly, we need to remember where we have come from, Paul says. You know, there's a phrase that many of you will have heard, God helps those who help themselves. You know that phrase? Well, it's not from the Bible. It's ungodly. (laughs) It's not, it's really from Greek thought and philosophy. The Bible's teaching is actually the opposite. God helps those who can't help themselves and know it. God helps those who can't help themselves and know it. God helps the lost, the hopeless, the poor, the lonely, the sick, and the dead. And the first thing we need to remember is that before we were Christians, before we were believers, before we were followers of Jesus, we were dead. Clearly Paul means spiritually dead, because he writes that we were dead in trespasses and sins in which we walked. So it's almost like we're like walking dead, or the living dead. That's how we were before Christians, before we were Christians. The Bible describes it like that, very black and white. It doesn't say we were almost dead, or even desperately ill, or even asleep, or drowning, or even it's like you were dead, but dead. That's what the Bible says. All of us, before the power of God in the gospel comes to us, we are dead in our sins. What does this mean to be dead spiritually? Well, the opposite, of course, is to be alive, alive and to have life. And the Bible defines life for us, Jesus specifically defined life for us like this in John 17. Now, this is eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ. So to be alive is to know God and know Jesus Christ. That is to be alive. So if eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ, eternal death is to be ignorant of God and not to know God, and not to know Jesus Christ. And being dead to God, we're at the mercy of this ungodly world, with its whims and fancies and fashions and habits and lusts and desires and personality and celebrity cults and systems, everything that's going. We're at the mercy of all that if we're not alive to God. How quickly we get hooked onto the latest fad or way of thinking, don't we? How quickly we, we, we move towards just thinking the way the world thinks. We get sucked in. And without Christ, there's nothing we seem to be able to do about it. The forces of this world seem to pull us in the wrong direction, seem to grip us 
and take us down paths that we don't even realise are leading in the wrong direction. And we, we follow the way. Somebody once said about alcoholics, no one sets out to be an alcoholic. Yeah. But they get trapped. And they go down a way. No one sets out. No one sets out to constantly lose their temper. But they're trapped. No one sets out to do all sorts of things. But actually, there's, there's a, a pull in that direction. There's a pull in that direction from our own nature, from the devil, from the world. There's a pull in that direction. Just look around and listen to the news. Riots, violence, sexual abuse, corruption, lying, greed. It's all there. Without Christ, we are lost and hopeless and dead. And we do well to remember that. Then the picture that Paul paints gets even worse. Because he wants us to remember, he wants us to remember how we were powerless and desperate and by nature objects or under God's wrath. Wow. Now people often think of God's wrath as anger in terms of sinful human anger, sort of lashing out in temper. But God's wrath is always holy and pure and is still consistent with being love. So much so that he's disgusted with sin and does not tolerate it. God knows that sin is bad for us. We sometimes doubt that. <laughs> we sometimes enjoy sin a bit too much. <laughs> but actually, God knows it's bad for us and for this world. And out of his love, he does not tolerate it. He knows what's good for us and he knows what's bad for us. Thank you, guys. By nature, we follow sinful desires and thoughts. In fact, Pete was preaching about this last week when he was preaching on David and Bathsheba. You know, David did not set out to commit adultery. He did not set out to lie to God and to the prophets and to everybody else. He did not set out to murder. But that's where he ended up. He was caught. He was caught and he started down a track. But he didn't intend to. And, and he was confident in that. He was king. He thought, I've got the right to. I can do this. I have the right. I am King David. <laughs> Look what I've achieved. Yeah. I can do this, I can do that. I can do... Nobody can question me. Actually, somebody did question him in the end. <laughs> God. Well, a prophet of God first. Uh, yeah. And he was confident in that. And we find within ourselves all sorts of desires and lusts and ambitions that are deeply damaging to ourselves or others, and offensive to a holy God. You know, it's become very popular to argue that the desires and ambitions that people find deep within themselves must obviously be God-given, and therefore should be followed and approved, particularly in discussions about sexual morality. So people will say, well, this is how God made me, so this is how I should live. But that just doesn't work. And so obviously flawed, think about it. There are many people with deep desires that both deep, deep desires and ambitions and feelings that most definitely need to be kept in check and discouraged. Highly aggressive people, rapists, child abusers, dishonest people, cruel people, controlling, dictatorial, disrespectful, prejudiced people, all with strong desires and ambitions. But we don't say they should just be allowed to follow their desires and leanings. In fact, in many cases, we have strong laws to keep in check and punish people who behave in such ways, and quite rightly so. Yeah. So just because people find desires and ambitions within themselves doesn't necessarily mean that those desires are to be followed and acted on. In particular, some of you know where I'm going, mm -hmm. there is a God-given way to express our humanity as male and female and a God-given way to express our sexuality between men and women in the context of marriage between a man and a woman. Yeah. That is God-given. Other things are harmful. Other things are harmful. And just because the desires and the ambitions are there doesn't make them automatically okay. So left to ourselves without Christ, we find we are in a desperate, hopeless, and powerless situation, spiritually dead, trapped by the ways of the world and the devil and following our sinful cravings and nature and under the wrath of God. 
It's a reality we have to face up to and be clear about. It's our starting place in our relationship with God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great 20th century, early 20th century preacher, points out, confronted with all this, the amazing thing is that any of us stand at all, let alone as a Christian. It is amazing, isn't it? (laughs) How on earth do we stand before God? How do we even survive? It can only be because of the magnificent kindness and mercy and grace of God and the power of God to save those who believe. So you'll be glad to know that I am moving on to but God, who is rich in mercy. Phew! (laughs) Being rich in mercy, entirely out of his love and kindness and mercy, he, God, the God of the heavens and the earth, the universe, has made us alive with Christ, saving us and raising us up and seating us in heavenly places with him. Something powerful has happened that has changed our entire situation. Jesus on the cross took the punishment as God in Christ for us, dying in our place, bringing forgiveness and freedom from guilt and shame, and then rising from the dead to live forever as a living saviour. That powerfully changes lives. I remember when we were in China, uh, we were teaching English at a, a middle school, Um, huge classes of 60 odd in the class and Sue was teaching one class I was teaching another class and uh, we weren't allowed to preach uh, at all but we were allowed to tell um, stories about our uh, our, um, English customs so when it came to Easter we would tell the Easter story to the class and uh, Sue was teaching one time and she was telling the story of Easter and the cross and the resurrection and to help the kids understand because they were learning English and of such big classes, she had a book with a picture of Jesus on the cross. And she walked up and down the aisles um, of the classroom, um, because the classroom was so big they couldn't really see from the front, and just, well, this is Jesus on the cross. And one young man, um, in his broken English, just said, why did Jesus die? Um, And Sue couldn't really say much in class, but just said, he died to forgive us. Um, uh, If you want to come and talk to us about it, uh, come and see us. And that's all she said. And uh, that afternoon, he knocked on our door. We were living on the campus. Um, it was a campus school. Um, we were living on the, on the school grounds. He came and knocked on our door, and he wanted to know more, and he gave his life to Jesus that afternoon. His life was set in a new direction because of Jesus on the cross. That is the power of the gospel. Our own son, Philip, um, as he went through his teen years, Um, He got very apathetic and um, disinterested in church. Um, I don't think he lost his faith as such, but uh, um, but clearly wasn't following Jesus. Um, And uh, then he was due to go to university. And uh, we were due to go to Tajikistan, leave the country. And he went off to university, and I think the next week we went off to Tajikistan. So that was a big thing in our hearts, to leave him. And we just had to commit him into the care of, of God. Um, not really knowing which direction he would choose with all the options and all the choices at university. Where was he going to end up, really? Um, And uh, it was about a year later, or so, I can't remember exactly, he wrote this amazing email to us. Now, if you know my son, he's not a communicator. He barely telephones us, let alone writes an email to us. So (laughs) uh, he wrote us this amazing email just saying how he'd been at a meeting, he'd gone to, a, uh, I think, a young people's meeting, it was, I think it was a precursor to New Day and things, um, and someone had preached the gospel and he'd gone forward and he said, it was like a huge weight off my shoulders, I cannot express what a weight it was, and I found peace and joy, I'm being baptised next month, mum and dad, and he was just so full of joy, and uh, it was so, we were so full of joy as well, that God had had his hand on his life, And now he was going in the right direction. That's the grace of God. And we are saved by grace. That's how it happens. His undeserving favour. Through faith, trust and belief in Jesus, we're saved. We're joined with Christ in his death, his resurrection and his ascension to heaven. Brought to life from death, remember. 
Not deserved, not earned, but a gift. I can remember so clearly the first time I rem- well, it's the first time I remember clearly hearing the gospel. I was at school, I was 17 years old, and although I'd been brought up with some church background, it had never made an impact. It wasn't an evangelical church. It was, um, it was what it was. Um, and uh, uh, a Christian friend of mine had invited two people from his church. Um, it was uh, the church in Biggin Hill that I was later to join, to come and sing and, uh, and share the gospel. And uh, my friend invited me to go along. And I can remember so clearly uh, Dave and Jeff Gillard, uh, Dave sang and Jeff preached, and he preached from Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he made this distinction between wages that you have to work for, And, you know, if you work well, if you do your week's work, you're going to get the wage at the end of it. Um, If you don't work, if you didn't turn up for no particular reason, you wouldn't get your wage. But the gift of eternal life that is not dependent on our work, but is a gift. And it was the first time the gospel began to ring in my heart. It was a little while later that I became a Christian. But it it was that seed was sown. Wow, this is a gift. This is something different. This is something dramatic. Some of you may know the stories of James Herriot, the Yorkshire vet, and the TV series, All Creatures Great and Small. Does that ring any bells with some people? Yeah, it's a bit of an old one now. But. And one anecdote that is told there is of a time when James was taking his wife out for a celebratory meal in a small local restaurant. And due to a series of mishaps that's retold in the, in the story, when he came to pay the bill, he found that he'd lost his wallet and had no means to pay. However, to his complete astonishment, the waiter told him that the bill had already been paid entirely by his senior partner at the veterinary practice, whom James thought was really a bit of a grumpy old man, basically. (laughs) But this partner knew that they were going out and had paid for James's restaurant bill in whole, in, in entirety, and said it was to be charged to his account as a gift. And in a very small way, that's like the gift of the grace of God to us. Perhaps we should even add that with God a bottle of champagne is provided as well, (laughs) along with a live band to entertain. Because we're brought into such wonderful, abundant life. That's the amazing grace and favour of God to us. Everything paid and a rich inheritance of being a son in God's family to boot. That's amazing, isn't it? Our salvation is not from ourselves. It's a gift of God. Even our faith is given by God. There's nothing we could have done to solve that hopeless, desperate, powerless situation in which we were. And we each need to admit that we were dead and sinful by nature and following the ways of the world and our desires. And then that Jesus died and rose again from death for you and I. And in that moment of belief and commitment to him, you're saved, forgiven, set free, and given eternal life, saved from God's eternal wrath as a gift. Paul puts it like this in Romans 10, verses 9 to 11, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. Finally, oh no, not quite finally, I shouldn't say that. (laughs) The next point. Paul ends like this, by writing about God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus it's an artistic term perhaps implying a great work of art a painting or a sculpture or a poem or something like that and if we're found in Christ through faith then that is how we are a masterpiece of God's creative love look around this is God's creative love in this room each one of us a masterpiece of God's creative love with a purpose, for good works, prepared for us. It's like a a new road, a new direction that's been given us. 
remember driving in the wrong direction at the beginning of, of, uh, of the talk along the motorway and not realising it. Now we have a new good road to travel on in the right direction prepared for us. So what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, it stops us boasting and keeps us from pride. Because it's nothing from us. It's nothing at all from us. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9 says, We're saved by grace, not from ourselves, not by works, so no one can boast. No one can boast. Let's not try to add to the masterpiece of our lives that God has created by adding in our own works. <laughs> Let's not smuggle in some good works into our salvation. There's no room in the portrait, this masterpiece, for human boasting. All the glory goes to God. The good works... All sorts of things are prepared for us to do as we go along the new road that God has laid out for us. The good works don't get us onto that road in the first place. Only Jesus can do that. His good work of salvation. And there are many good things for us to do. Many good spirit-filled things for us to do along the way. But our position, our place on the road is a gift of grace. The salvation that's been obtained by Jesus on the cross puts us on the road once we're on the road there are many good things for us to do that he's got prepared this should make us cherish our forgiveness more and more the more we realise we're forgiven the more we're grateful the more we love our saviour Jesus Jesus told a story about that didn't he about the two men one was forgiven a little bit and one was forgiven a whole load of money. And then he asked the Pharisee, well, who do you think loves me more? <laughs> well, he who knows he's been given, for, forgiven a lot. We remember how much we've been forgiven, how terrible our plight or state before God was. If it hadn't been for the power of the gospel, we would still be like that. Probably not even realising it. Because most people don't. We would... Be, and if we realise this, we will be moved and not half-hearted. We would love with all our hearts, love God with all our hearts, and love your neighbour as yourself, said Jesus. We will be so grateful to be a child in his kingdom, undeserving, but given the, gist, uh, the, given the gift of salvation so freely. So how can we take on board and remember the message of Ephesians 2? What can help us to remember this? God has given us several ways. We do it when we take communion, the Lord's Supper. We're not doing that this morning as it happens, but uh, when we do that, we are remembering the Lord's death and his resurrection. That helps us to remember. Baptism helps us. I was baptised on a certain day. I remember my baptism. If you haven't been baptised as an adult, as a, as a consenting adult, or a child old enough to consent anyway, uh, then then. Jesus says we are to be baptised. And that's really helpful as a reminder of what we once were. It's a before and after step. You can remember your baptism. Before, you were not in Christ. Now you are in Christ. And here's a sign of it. And here's a date that it happened. The last person we baptised in this room was Helen, wasn't it? <laughs> and before that, you hadn't been baptised. Now you have been baptised. There's a date that you can remember. Before that... Wasn't, I wasn't in Christ. Now I'm in Christ. And the baptism was a symbol of that. Baptism is really helpful. Reading the word. Reading chapters like Ephesians 1 and 2. I challenge you, read it this week. Read Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2 this week. It will both bless you and challenge you. In all that God has done. Of course, we need to receive Jesus. Do you realise that without knowing God through Jesus, you are lost. You're without hope and the spiritually dead. That's why we share with people our faith. That's why we <coughs> do things like laser light and all sorts of things, because we were wanting to reach people. And we can pray for the Holy Spirit that he will lead us into all truth. The whole, one of the works of the Holy Spirit is that he will lead us into truth. I believe we've heard truth this morning. I hope we have. As I've been preaching, I've been preaching the truth. Yeah. Well, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth. It's like he burns it in our hearts. He 
fills us again and again, reminds us of the truth as well. That's another work of the Holy Spirit, to remind us of truth. He doesn't only lead us to truth, he reminds us of truth. So we can ask, this is why it's so important that we ask the Holy Spirit every day to fill us. Because we need reminding. Who forgets these sort of things sometimes? You just amble through life. <laughs> and you forget where you've come from. You forget what great salvation you've got now. Hallelujah. Well, we need the Holy Spirit to remind us and to lead us into all truth. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish. Um, it would be great, Matt, if we could come back to worship.